Alrighty, we pick it up on session 36, lesson 7, page 1 of your outline. So on page 1 you see that it's one of our, our uh, mini tables of contents. Covers the sections that we'll be going over in lesson 7. And we are in part 7, which is the ministry of the Messiah around Galilee continued. So on the first page we start in section 116 and if you'll turn the page over to page 2 we will go through part 8, uh, the first two sections of part 8, the later Judean ministry, will go through section 134. So this lesson will take, will cover those sections. Alright, so let's pick it up then on section 116. All right, this is the warning about the error of the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Herodians. Now last week, when we uh, finished up section 115, uh, Jesus leaves the fishing village of Magadan, and we learn that in Mark 8.13. So if you'll look at section 116, where the Mark account is the left, excuse me, the right-hand column, and verse 13 of the Mark account, and leaving them, he again embarked and went away to the other side. So he leaves the little fishing village of Magadan and goes over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. So here is the map of the Sea of Galilee and the area of Magadan, Magdala, Kibbutz Ginusar, uh, modern Kibbutz Ginusar, uh, there on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. So they leave that area and they go to the east side of the Sea of Galilee, but we don't know where. It doesn't tell us exactly where, just somewhere on the eastern shore. The important uh, point to note is that this is Gentile territory. So once again, Yeshua has left Jewish territory, going into Gentile territory, seeking privacy and um, a little calmer situation in order to teach the disciples. He's preparing them for the ministry they will have on his departure. Alrighty. So he uh, begins by warning them against three types of leaven. Now what's this deal with leaven? Well, leaven is a biblical symbol of sin. And so Yeshua utilizes that symbol out of the Tanakh. And that symbol is found in the New Testament as well. And I've given you some quotes at the bottom of page 3. I'll put those quotes up on the screen for those who are on YouTube. Here is the, uh, some of the usages of this symbol of leaven. In the Talmud, for example, Maaseh Berachot 17a, Rav Alexandri, on concluding his prayer, used to add the following. Sovereign of the universe, it is known full well to thee that our will is to perform thy will. And what prevents us? The yeast in the dough. Well, is he talking about a baker there? He's complaining about his uh, village baker? No, he's not. Uh, footnote number three explains that. This is a footnote in my copy of the Talmud. That is the evil impulse. So the yeast in the dough is the evil impulse, uh, which causes a ferment ferment in the heart. And so just as uh, yeast is really, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Yeast is really uh, fermentation. fermentation, yeah, but it's, um, it's a kind of rotting. What, do you, what would you call it there? Huh? No, what's the word? Well, anyway, ye say again? Corrupt. Corruption, there you go. Yeast is really a corruption, and so uh, that's what he's saying. The yeast in the dough it symbolizes the evil impulse in the heart. Say again? What? How much is 11 worth? How much is 11 worth? I think you should go to jail for that one. <laughs> yeah, good idea. And leave him there. All right, Galatians, picking it up in the New Testament. Rabbi Shaul, the Apostle Paul, picks it up in Galatians 5, 7 through 9. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. Don't listen to persuasions like this to stop obeying the truth. Uh, a little bit of disobedience here, 
soon leads to a lot of disobedience. And Paul picks that up again in 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, because, you know, he was a Pharisaic rabbi. He, uh, he was very familiar with this stuff. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Same idea here. Boasting is a sin. You know, arrogance, pride. Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. See, when, uh, when Yeshua, when we came to faith in Yeshua and His Holy Spirit indwelt us, we were cleansed. You know, our position is uh, cleansed before Him. So we need to live out our lives in, um, consistent with our position in the Messiah. You are, in fact, unleavened, for Messiah, our Passover, has been sacrificed. So he ties in the fact that we're unleavened with the sacrifice of Yeshua. And then he goes on, Therefore, let us celebrate the feast. So I think it's valid to celebrate Passover from a Messianic perspective because of its importance. Not with the old leaven, that's the uh, boasting and pride, nor with a couple of more pieces of leaven, the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So here again, leaven is associated with sin, with sin, common symbol in the Bible, both in the Old and New Testament. So Yeshua is going to utilize that symbol here, but here it's going to be a symbol of false teaching. He uses it as a symbol of false teaching. So let's pick it up on the Matthew account. Um, the Matthew account is the left-hand column, section 116. We'll pick it up on verses 5 and 6. Everybody get there in their harmonies? Verse 5. And the disciples came to the other side and had forgotten to take bread. And Jesus said to them, Watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So here he mentions two kinds of leaven. The leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of the Sadducees. Now, cross over to the right-hand column and verse 15 of the Mark account. Just go directly across to verse 15 and Mark covers it this way. And he was giving orders to them saying, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. So when we combine the two, two uh, accounts together, we see there are three kinds of leaven that he warns against. The third kind is the leaven of Herod. All right, what's the difference? between these three kinds of leaven. Well, first of all, what was the Pharisees' false teaching? What was the religious party's false teaching? The religious false teaching was the fact that Jesus is not the Messiah on the grounds of being demon-possessed. The rejection of his Messiahship. He's not the Messiah. He's demon-possessed. Secondly, the Sadducees had false teaching. What was the priestly Parties false teaching. Their teaching was he is against the temple. <coughs> now they're picking up on John 2.19 and at the end of Yeshua's ministry they will falsely accuse him. They will say he said he, he said that he would destroy the temple. That is false. What did Yeshua actually say? In John 2.19 I'm going to expand the Greek a little bit. Now you can't always see this in the English, unfortunately, because the English doesn't or isn't as sophisticated as the Greek. So let me expand the Greek a little bit. Jesus answered them, You all destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The uh, Greek pronoun there is in the second person plural. Now we don't have that in English unless you're from south of uh, the Mason-Dixon line, right? Y'all? Yeah. Y'all? Okay. Alright, so if this was a, a, a southern translation, you'd put y'all in there. So you see, speaking to those who are opposing him in the temple, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he's saying, you all destroy this temple, and he's talking about himself here, and three days I will raise it up. So he did not say, I will destroy the temple. See, that is a false teaching of the, of the uh, Sadducees. He said, you will destroy this temple, speaking of himself. All righty. Now, what's the false teaching of the Herodians? They're the political party. And the Herodians supported the rule of Herod uh, under Rome. 
So their false teaching is he is against the rule of Rome through the house of Herod. He is king of the Jews. He claims to be king of the Jews. He is an insurrectionist, a criminal. So that's their false teaching. Uh, Question. Did the Pharisees continue this rejection of Jesus to the time he went to the cross? How could they answer that he cast out demons and yet you're accusing him of being a demon himself? Well, that's it. They say he's empowered to cast out demons because he himself is demon possessed. That's their whole position. That's their position, yeah. All right, let's move on to Matthew 16, verse 7. Go down to the next verse in the Matthew account. That's the left-hand column. And they began to discuss among themselves, saying, It's because we took no bread. So the, the disciples don't get it. They don't understand what he's talking about. You know, they're thinking loaves of bread. And so Jesus has to reprimand them a bit for this. Verses 8 through 11. But Yeshua, aware of this, said, You men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves and the five thousand and how many baskets you took up? Or the seven loaves of the four thousand and how many large baskets you took up? How is it that you do not understand that I do not speak to you concerning bread? But beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So he's actually got two lessons for them here. The first lesson he stated quite clearly there. Beware of false teaching. Especially false teaching about his person and his work. Good warning for us today as well. But he also knows they haven't really got it in regard to the lesson of the miraculous feedings. And the, remember last week I mentioned that Yeshua points out that there were two miraculous feedings. And there was the verse right there. Okay. So the second lesson is that Jesus can provide in any situation. But they are overly concerned with the physical and not the spiritual. So they're kind of in a rut there. And he has to keep reminding them of the lesson they're supposed to be learning. All right, let's move on to the final verse in the section, verse 12 of the Matthew account. Then they understood that he did not say to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Ha! Now they get that lesson. They really get it. Be aware of false teaching regarding his person and work. Again, a good reminder for us as well, especially in this day and age. All right, let's move on to section 117, page 4 at the top of lesson 7. And we pick this up in the middle of page 115, section 117, the healing of a blind man near Bethsaida. All right, as far as the location of this miracle, we pick that up in verse 22. The first verse there of the section, Mark 8, 22. And they came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and entreated him to touch him. So as far as the location goes, here's our map. They are on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. We don't know where. There's Bethsaida up on the northeastern shore. So they leave, they get in a boat and leave the eastern shore and head up north to Bethsaida. So that's where they're located for this miracle, to the north. Now the important thing to note is that we're back in Jewish territory. Bethsaida was actually just a hop, skip and a jump outside of Galilee in uh, the province of Syria, but it still was a Jewish town. So this was Jewish territory. He's back in among Jewish people. Now the miracle is covered for us in verses 23 through 25. Verse 23. And taking the blind man by the hand, he brought him out of the village. And after spitting on his eyes and laying his hands upon him, he asked him, Do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see men. For I am seeing them like trees walking about. Then again he laid his hands upon his eyes, and he looked intently and was restored, 
and began to see everything clearly. All right. He's dealing with this blind man, and you notice it says he spit on his eyes. Remember, saliva is considered medicinal in this culture. It seems kind of gross and yucky to us. We don't, we don't uh, go for that. But he's working within the culture of the day. And uh, some examples of this idea. In the Talmud, there's a, uh, an account from uh, Baba Bathra 126b. When people came to his father, he used to say to them, Go to my son Sikath, who is firstborn, and his spittle heals. So you see very clearly they, th they thought spit was healing. There is a tradition that the spittle of the firstborn of a father is healing. But that of the firstborn of a mother is not healing. Now don't ask me why. I don't know why. I don't know the reasoning there. But the point I want to make here is that they believe saliva was medicinal. Also in uh, Shabbat 14.4, they say in the name of Rav, Rav Yochanan, the eye which became inflamed do they treat on the Sabbath. And I've edited it down a little bit here for you. Rav said, wine may be placed outside of the eyes on the Sabbath, but may not be placed inside of the eyes. And of course, wine was thought to be healing as well. Samuel said this, it is prohibited to put tasteless spit into the eye on the Sabbath. So the eye, same idea. Uh, a spittle is, is a healing, has healing properties. So, don't ask me why he makes that distinction. I do not know. I do not know. Okay? Oh, Alright, do you have a comment? <laughs> um, I'll keep an eye out for you. Keep an eye out for me. Alright, that... But they spat in Jesus' face, right? Right, but that was a symbol of uh, rejection and humiliation. Right. So, I, I'm interested in that. It has... In one case, it's therapeutic. In the other case, it's... Well, it depends on the context, again. If the guy has inflamed eyes, yeah. and you bring him to the doctor for healing. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Now, I want you to also note that Jesus took him out of the village. So the policy of privacy still holds. This miracle is not for all of Bethsaida to see. It is for the individual. Now, this is a very unique miracle because it happens in two stages. This is the only miracle in which uh, the healing does not happen totally and instantly happens in two stages. First of all, he has partial sight. He sees men walking around, but they're fuzzy. They're, they're like trees, you know? There's these weird things moving around out there. And then he has total sight. He sees people clearly. Now, why? Well, I'm going to suggest that the miracle, number one, depicts the disciple's spiritual condition. But number two, I think we can say that it also depicts Israel's spiritual condition. So let's take a look at the last verse, verse 26, and then we'll uh, take a look at the application. The last verse, verse 26, he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. So again, he emphasizes this policy of privacy. Don't let anyone in Bethsaida see you, at least not right away. I'm sure word would get out soon enough. Now, the application to the disciples. The disciples now see partially. They are partially sighted. We'll see this in the next paragraph, paragraph 118. But the fact that they are also partially blind will come out in paragraph 119. So they're partially sighted and partially blind. The total removal of the blindness will come at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit is poured out and indwells them. Then all the blindness will evaporate. Now, what about the application to Israel? And we're now at the bottom of page 4. Now, as a result of the rejection of the Messiah, Romans 11 says that a partial blindness has befallen Israel. Romans 11.25 For I do not want you brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, but a partial hardening. See, a partial blindness 
has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Okay, so because Israel is only partially hard, partially blind, there are Jewish people coming to a saving knowledge of Yeshua in the Jewish community. There's always been a faithful remnant from the second or from the first century clear up to today. Now we in the faithful remnant are very small. We only make up 1% of the worldwide Jewish community today. But we are still there. So Israel is partially sighted today. But Israel is almost totally blind. 99% blind. That blindness, that partial blindness will re be removed at the end of the tribulation period. Romans 11 also says in um, verse 26, And so all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the Deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. So someday, uh, every living J Jewish man, woman, and child at the end of the tribulation period will place their faith in Yeshua. The veil will be taken away from every living Jewish person's eyes at that time. We will place our faith in Yeshua. We will call on him to return, and he will re return to deliver us from our enemies. So the restoration of total sight will happen, uh, as Romans 11.26 says, at the end of the tribulation period. So that's what we're working for in Hadavar. We're trying to set up uh, everything for that. We're trying to find the remnant now and set up the, uh, set up the uh, uh, faith of Israel at the end of the tribulation period. That's what we're working for. Getting the word out. Planting the seeds. All right, lesson seven, page five at the top. We come to section 118, and Peter's identification as the, of Jesus as the Messiah and the first prophecy of the church. So again, in section 118, we will see that the disciples have partial sight. Now the location will be Caesarea Philippi. Now here's the map, and you can see Bethsaida kind of in the middle of the map there on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And Caesarea Philippi is uh, quite a bit north, so they will leave Bethsaida, and they will go up the valley to Caesarea Philippi. And the important thing to note is that this is once again in Gentile territory. Here's a map of the regions in the first century. The yellow splotch over here on the left side is Galilee. And you'll notice Bethsaida is located in the orange area, which is Syria. And Caesarea uh, Philippi is very much in the orange area. So this is Gentile territory. Gentile territory. So he goes outside of Galilee again to train his disciples. Now the geography of Caesarea Philippi is very, very important to what follows. Question? Just to clarify, I thought you said that Bethsaida was... Yes, it's where Jews live, but it was located just outside of Galilee. Remember I said a hop, skip, and a jump outside of Galilee? But it was a Jewish village. Okay. All right. Now, first of all, regarding the geography of Caesarea Philippi, it sits at the foot of Mount Hermon, which is the tallest mountain in the Holy Land, 9,000 feet. And uh, it uh, often has snow on it, especially in the winter. Sometimes the snow remains on it throughout the summer as well. So there is the Mount Hermon mountain range uh, seen from the Golan Heights. Now if you go to the town of Caesarea Philippi, and you will when you visit Israel, all of you, correct, yes, thank you, uh, you will see that the town is overshadowed by a huge cliff. And here as we enter the town, you can see that cliff coming into view. In the foreground, of course, is some of the ruins that have been excavated by the archaeologists. Now, as you get into the downtown area, the cliff becomes even more pronounced and uh, more overshadowing, whatever you'd like to say about it. So there's another view of the downtown area. And again, here's a view of that cliff again. It does dominate Caesarea Philippi. Now, this uh, town was a center of, of uh, Roman, Greek uh, idol worship. 
And if you go up onto this uh, level area, up in the middle of the uh, cliff, you come to the um, area where these many idols and Greek gods, etc., and Roman gods were worshipped. Now here's a sign with a uh, drawing that archaeologists feel uh, depict what the site looked like in the first century. So you can see on the sign you've got uh, seven temples there. The temple to Augustus, to the god Pan, the nymphs, Zeus, Nemesis, the sacred goats, and the temple of Pan and the dancing goats. So it is an area of uh, quite a bit of idol worship. And there again you can see the drawing that when you go to Israel you can photograph and you can see the many temples there. On the left is the Temple of Augustus and it is butting up against the Grotto of Pan. That's the grotto right behind it. And off on the far right you can see the Temple of the Dancing Goats and everything in between. So it is quite an idol worship center. Now there's Jane. She's standing right in front of the Grotto of Pan. You can see the sign that I photographed there at the bottom uh, left corner. And again you can see the niches that were carved out of the cliff uh, and offerings were placed in those niches by the worshippers. And again uh, when you wander around throughout the town you can see some of the archaeological finds that have been unearthed and put on display. So it is a fantastic and fascinating archaeological place to visit. So uh, that's the first aspect of the town we need to keep in mind. Uh, secondly, uh, you'll note that a stream flows out of the base of the cliff. Now that cliff uh, continues on up to Mount Hermon. And the, uh, the stream is the Banyas River. And it flows out of that cliff and it is one of the four headwaters of the Jordan. And it's fed by the melting snows of, the, of Mount Hermon. So here is the uh, Banyas River flowing through Caesarea Philippi. Now inside that stream, when you go there and look into the stream, you will see there are a good number of small rocks and pebbles located in the bottom of the stream. And those rocks and pebbles have fallen off the cliff there uh, at Caesarea Philippi. Now it is very, very, very important to understand the geography of Caesarea Philippi because it helps us understand what's going to happen next in section, 100, uh, section 118. There is a reason, there is a reason why we are told where this event takes place. All right, how much time do I have? I've got 10 seconds, so I'm going to let you guys take your break. And we'll pick up section 118 after the break. So listen for the shofar, and we'll come back and hit section 118. All righty, let's go ahead and pick it up then on section 118. We've uh, kind of set up the background of the passage. So we begin at the bottom of page 5 with the examination. So uh, Yeshua has warned the disciples about three types of leaven. Now he's going to give them an examination to see if they've understood that warning. They say they have. So he's going to give them two questions. Uh, question one is at the bottom of page five. And we pick that up in Matthew 16, verses 13 and 14. So we're at the bottom of page 115 in the left-hand column with verse 13. Everybody get there okay? All right. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he began asking his disciples, saying, who do, you, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So the answer of the disciples indicates that the masses do see and do understand something of the supernatural character of Jesus. But they are unwilling to come to the conclusion that he is the messianic person. So the masses offer all kinds of Jewish explanations for who he is. Elijah, the prophet, something like that. 
They're unwilling to come to the obvious conclusion. All right, now he moves on to section or question number two. We're on page six now, top of page six of lesson seven. And so we'll pick it up on verse 15. Uh, still the left-hand column, verse 15. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Now the um, Greek here is very, very emphatic. And again, it's something that doesn't show up very much in the English because it's a different language. The Greek has an emphatic position. And so basically he says, you, who do you say that I am? You see, this is a pop quiz for these guys. And again, that you is a second person plural. Y'all, who do y'all say that I am, okay? All of them, all 12. What is your answer? Verse 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. <coughs> now Peter's answer in the Greek is also very, very emphatic. Now the Greek has a Greek definite article. The definite article is the word the. You know, the table, the chair we have a definite article too. But in Greek, the definite article stresses individual identity. That's the stress of the article in Greek. Peter says, you are the Messiah, the Son of the God, the Living One. Terrible English. Great Greek. Great Greek. You're not going to see that in the English, okay? This is a very emphatic, positive identification of who Jesus is and who the God is that he's talking about. He's talking about Israel's God and that Jesus is the Messianic person. And so the lesson has been learned. They are aware now of the three types of leaven that criticize and misrepresent Yeshua's person and work. So Jesus responds in verse 17. As a good professor, they have passed their pop quiz. Maybe you had to start doing pop quizzes in here too, huh? Yeah. What, what? No? <laughs> all right, all right. Twist my arm. Verse 17. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Simon, that's his given name. He was renamed by Yeshua in John 1.48. He was, he was renamed Peter, Petras, or that's the Greek, and Cephas, that's the Aramaic. All those words mean stone. So if he was among us today, we'd call him Rocky, right? <laughs> hey, Rock, hey, Rocky, come over here. You know, who do you say that I am? So the confession that Peter utters is a result of divine illumination given to him by the Father. Divine illumination. All right, now let's move to page six in the middle there, and we're going to, we're uh, looking at the word Petros. Let's read verse 18. Verse 18, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. So Petros is the heading there. Now Yeshua is going to do a play on words. You know, uh, the Bible, interesting, the Hebrew Bible is full of word plays. Isaiah loves to do that. So Jewish people love to pun and do word plays. <laughs> now, he's going to enlarge on Peter's name here, on Peter's nickname, the rock, in Matthew 6.18. He says, I also say to you that you are Petros. And now the, very, the next statement is very important. Because a Petros is a small stone. The Petros means a small stone, a stone that you can pick up and throw, like the stones in the, in the base of the Banyas River coming out of the cliff at Caesarea Philippi. 
I also say that you are Petros, and upon this, and he uses a different word, different form of the verb, word, and upon this Petra, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. You don't see this in the English, because we don't have the same vocabulary. You see, you see rock in both of them. Now this is important because we know very clearly that a Petros is a small stone. But what is a Petra? A Petra is a huge, massive cliff rock. Okay, you see the difference there? So we know the first element, the Petros, is Peter. But what is the second element? Well, some say that Peter is what the church is built on. But I really have to disagree. Little stones don't make great foundations for a church. Okay? In order to reach that position, that Peter is what the church is built upon, the uh, commentator has to ignore basic Greek vocabulary and grammar. Okay? So, Peter is a Petros here. He is a small stone, a throwable stone. But let's go to Petra now, in the middle of page 6. A Petra is a huge, massive cliff rock. He says, upon this rock, this Petra, I will build my church. So, some commentators say that it is Peter's confession of faith that Yeshua is referring to. Not Peter himself, but his confession of faith. Well, I don't have a great objection to that, but I think there's a better position. So I'm going to share, you, share with you what I feel the position is. And uh, I think the better position centers around the fact that a rock in Scripture can often be a symbol of the Messiah. For example, Daniel 2, 44 and 45. Nebuchadnezzar has had this dream that's upset him. And the dream is explained to him. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left to another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. Those are the kingdoms in the dream. A stone was cut out of a mountain and it crushed those kingdoms, those Gentile kingdoms of the world. The great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. And of course, a study of the book of Daniel uh, makes it very, very clear that the stone is the messianic person at the second coming. When Yeshua comes, he will crush the world system of government. Okay? So the stone is Yeshua here. Daniel, uh, excuse me, Psalm 118.22. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Again, a prophecy of the Messiah. He's referred to as a stone here. Isaiah 28.16. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation. Firmly placed, he who believes in it will not be disturbed. Again, another picture of the messianic person. He will be a foundation. He is a stone. Now this is picked up by Peter in the New Covenant, the New Testament. In 1 Peter 2.8, Peter says that Yeshua is a stone of stumbling and a rock. He uses the word Petra. A rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word. And to this doom they were also appointed. Paul picks, up, picks this idea up in 1 Corinthians 10.4. Speaking of Israel, they all drank the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them. And the rock... He uses the word Petra. The rock was the Messiah. You can't get a, a stronger association than that. So I feel a better position 
is that Petra refers to Yeshua. And when he says, upon this rock, he's pointing to himself. He's pointing to himself. First Corinthians 10.4, was that in the wilderness water? Yeah, right, yes, exactly. Okay. Did that leave the apostles petrified? Did that leave the apostles petrified? <laughs> I'm speechless. I'm speechless. All right. So what he is saying is this. Using the geography of Caesarea Philippi as the background, we're at... Um, the top of page 7 now. What he's saying is this. Peter, you are Petras. You are like a little pebble. You are just like the little rocks that come out of the stream at the bottom of the huge, massive cliff rock. But, Peter, it is upon the Petra, it is upon this huge, massive cliff rock that I will build my congregation. And that's why the geography of Caesarea Philippi is so important. So when, uh, when I go to Israel, I take people to this position mm -hmm. so they can, and I explain this to them so they can see this yeah. in place, right? <laughs> right, you remember that. So you can see this as it exists. So Peter understands accurately who Yeshua is. Yeshua is the Messiah, the Son of the God, the Living One. But now Yeshua enlarges his understanding Yeshua is also the foundation of the church. He's also the foundation of the assembly. And we've seen that mentioned earlier in Isaiah that he would be a foundation. And Paul picks up the idea that the Messiah is a foundation in 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 11. He says, we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus the Messiah. Okay? We don't lay foundations on ourselves. Our only foundation is Jesus. He is the rock. Anything else is the sand. Right? And the wise man builds upon the rock. Okay. So I feel that that's a better view of what the rock is. The rock is Yeshua himself. Now, um, Yeshua also mentions the gates of Hades. And the gates of Hades are simply a biblical term for physical death. I've given you the references. By the way, I made a typo there uh, in the line that says gates of Hades. You'll see Psalm 9.13. You'll also see Psalm 117.18. That should be 107.18. 107.18. My typo. I'm well over my three mistakes for the year. <laughs> God is being very gracious to me. He has not vaporized me yet. <laughs> Psalm 107. S say again. It was a typo. It wasn't my mistake. Thank you. Good. You're on my side. <laughs> All right. Let's take a look at these verses. Psalm 913. Be gracious to me, O Lord. See my affliction from those who hate me. You who lift me up from the gates of death. So the psalmist is afraid of being killed here. Psalm 10718. Their soul abhorred all kinds of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. So these people were nearing uh, death. Job 38, 17. God is speaking to Job and reprimanding him for his um, kind of arrogant, proud attitude. He says to him, have the gates of death been revealed to you? The gates of death. See, God knows all about physical death. Have you seen the gates of deep darkness? No, Job, you haven't. Isaiah 38, 10. A parallel thought. I said, in the middle of my life, I am to enter the gates of Sheol. Parallel thought. I am to be deprived of the rest of my years. So again, death is in view here. So the idea here is that physical death will not destroy the church. Physical death will not destroy the church. The Messiah's death did not destroy the church, did it? In fact, it was the whole foundation 
of the church. The church is built on the Messiah. Does the apostles' death hurt the church in any way? No. no? Did the church fathers' death hurt the church in any way? Will my death or your death in any way damage the church? No. Physical death is powerless over the Messiah's assembly, over the church. It has gone on now for 2,000 years in the face of much persecution, and no believer's death has ever uh, in any way compromised the church. Okay? Now, another thing I want you to notice is Jesus speaks in the future. He says, I will build my church. He's looking ahead to Pentecost. He's looking ahead to the future. Now, this one little statement, in my mind at least, effectively nullifies covenant theology, replacement theology. Covenant theology states that the church has existed since Adam. That's replacement theology, that Adam was a member of the church. But Jesus says here, in the future, he's going to build his church. That will happen at Pentecost. It is not yet in existence. All righty. Now let's go to page 8, the top of the page. And we'll talk about the keys of the kingdom. We'll pick it up on verse 19. The uh, first part of the verse, he says to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So Peter is given keys. Now, what do keys signify? Well, first of all, keys open and shut things. They allow you to go in and out. And keys in scripture also represent authority. If you have the keys, you have the authority to let people go in and out of a room, of a city, of whatever, okay? And this is a, a scene in Isaiah 22, 22. A man named Eliakim is going to uh, have authority in the house of David. And he is told, I will set the key of the house of David on his, on Eliakim's shoulder. So he receives authority. And when he, what, when he opens, no one will shut. And when he shuts, no one will open. So it's a picture of authority. Now Peter is given the keys. And that's important because Peter will re be responsible for opening the gospel door to three main groups of humanity. The three main groups of humanity mentioned in the New Testament. Jews, Samaritans, Gentiles. That's God's three three-part division of humanity. In Acts, 2's, in Acts 2, he will use the keys in relation to the Jewish community. In Acts 8, he will use the keys in, re in relation to the Samaritans. And in Acts 10, he will use the keys in relation to the Gentiles. So Peter's role when he receives the keys is very important. Very important to understand as we look at the book of Acts. So first of all, let's take a look at, um, at Acts 8, just briefly. In Acts 8, Philip preaches to the Samaritans, right? And they become believers. Now, normally, today for example, when one accepts the Messiah, when one accepts Christ, you're immediately baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of the Messiah. However, in Acts 8, None of these Samaritans receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because Peter is the one who must open the door of the church to them. So the Jerusalem church sends Peter, and then the Spirit comes to the Samaritans. It's because Peter, not Philip, has the keys to the kingdom. Now let's talk about Paul a little bit. Paul has not yet been chosen the apostle to the Gentiles. That will be his ministry. He was not the apostle to the Jews. He was the apostle to the Gentiles. Now in Acts 9, Paul gets saved. But Paul doesn't have the keys to the kingdom. The stage is just set. In Acts 10, and we looked at that last week, I believe, Peter opens the door to the Gentiles with the uh, incident with Cornelius. 
this Gentile uh, Roman um, centurion gets saved and the gospel door is open to the Gentiles. Then in Acts 13, Paul becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. In Acts 13, his ministry takes off. So it's very important to understand Peter's role here. Does that make sense? He has been given the keys. He exercised the keys. The doors of the gospel are now open to the entire world. Okay? Alrighty, let's take a look at the last part of verse 19. Middle of verse 19. He says, Whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So we're dealing with the concept of binding and loosing. We're on page 8 at the bottom of page 8. Now what is given to Peter will be given to all the apostles in John 20, 22, and 23. It's not limited exclusively to Peter. In the upper room, uh, during the Passover Seder, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. Now this is a privilege that comes with apostolic authority. And it is limited to the apostles. There's nothing in scripture that says it is transferable. It does not come down to us in the present day. Yes. <clears throat> On uh, verse 19, uh, verse 19 so whatever you it had to do us, but just Peter. Excuse me, what, what's the question again? It's a kingdom of heaven and whatever you shall buy on earth shall be bound. You is Peter only or No, uh, to the to the Peter and the apostles in John twenty. To them only. To, no, not to us. No, and we'll get into the term. Here's here you know, let me explain the term and we'll see why. All right. Now, binding and loosing is a figure of speech for authority, and it's very, very common in rabbinical writings. To loose, hetir, means to permit something. It means to permit something. And at the top of page 9, asar, to bind, means to prohibit something. To allow something or to prohibit something. To have the authority to do that. Now, the Pharisees took this authority upon themselves. Now, Jesus gives the apostles this authority in two senses. First of all, judicial sense. In the judicial sense, they have the authority to bind the guilty over for punishment or to loose the innocent from punishment. Okay, to punish or to forgive or to loose. The second sense is the legislative sense. And this is especially the sense that the Pharisees use the term hetir. To loose means to permit, to bind means to forbid. Now, the apostles use this authority in both senses. First of all, legislatively. We see them in the epistles, for example, permit and forbid items. The positive commands, they are permitting something. In the negative commands, they are forbidding something. An example of an apostolic use of this authority. And, it come, and we know what it is because they are writing the New Testament. This is basically an authority needed to write the New Testament. Now notice the negative and positive commands. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. So they're forbidding this. So that you obey its lust. And do not go on presenting the members of your body as sin, or to sin, as instruments of unrighteousness. But, now comes a positive command. Something that he permits. But present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. So here is the Apostle Paul using that authority to permit or to deny. And uh, it, it, we don't have the authority to command people what to do and what not to do. We have to rely on the scripture. 
And we can tell people what to do or not to do based on the scripture, not on me. I can't make up a rule for you or anybody or the church. I can go to scripture and tell you what the authority is, but that's it, okay? Now here's an example in the Mishnah. In Sotah 9.14, dealing with Jewish wedding practices. During the War of Vespasian, this is when General Vespasian was, was uh, destroying Judah, they forbade, they bound the crowns of the bridegrooms and the wedding drum. So they, the rabbis forbid a bridegroom from wearing a crown and from beating on the uh, wedding drum to, you know, uh, in celebration. During the War of Titus, now when Titus took over, they forbade, they bound the crown of the bride and that a man should teach his son Greek. So when things got worse, they forbid the bride to wear a crown at her wedding and they said it's no longer legal in Israel to teach your son Greek. During the last war, they forbade, they bound the bride to go forth in a litter inside the city. Uh, brides used to be paraded around the city inside a litter uh, in celebration of the upcoming wedding. They said, nope, can't do that anymore. But our rabbis thereafter permitted, literally loosed, the bride to go forth in a litter inside the city. So later on, they did loose, they did permit that practice. So you see the, the uh, terminology to, to bind or to loose here, to permit or to forbid. That's the idea here. So that's the legislative use of the term. And we, we, impact, we see its impact when we read the positive and negative commands of the New Testament. Now, page 9, at the bottom of the page, we come to the judicial use of this authority. And an example of that is Acts 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. They come to the church with their little tiny little white lie there. Uh, you know, they lie to the Holy Spirit, they lie to Peter, and they are judged. Peter binds them for judgment and they are smitten by the Holy Spirit, right? So that's the judicial use uh, of uh, bind and loose by an apostle. That's not going to happen to you if I get mad at you. If you lie to me, uh, nothing's going to happen. Believe me, I don't have the authority to cause your death in any way. Okay? None of us do. This is an apostolic privilege here. Now the only area that the church has authority like this today is in church discipline. Matthew 18, 15. We can go to the scriptures and we can say to a sinning brother, uh, you're not to do this. Even to the point of excommunication. But again, what's our basis for doing this? It's the apostolic forbidding and permitting laid down in scripture. We don't have the authority we can take that authority out of Scripture. But we don't have independent authority. So the authority to bind and loose was not passed on in apostolic succession. And by the way, it does have, has nothing to do with binding Satan. That is a common teaching today that you're going to bind Satan. Well, folks, if you bind Satan, I think somebody turns him loose immediately. Right. You know? Immediately. If I could bind Satan, you know what I would do? I'd bind him out of the universe and be done with him. Okay? There's nothing in the context here that deals with binding Satan. That is simply an uh, um, unfortunate interpretation taken out of context. Okay? Yes. The, the only time Satan's going to be bound is by God's angel when he's tossed into the, into the pit um, after the tribulation. That's the binding of Satan. A lot of prayer walking and say, I have claim in this neighborhood. And some people are against that. I mean, we, we have no power to claim. Well, we, we know that, we, that uh, it's God's will that everyone be saved. Right. And we can pray for everybody to be saved. But we don't know uh, which individual is going to be chosen to be saved. Again, it's that, that paradox of man's free will and God's omniscience and omnipotence. We are to pray, but only God knows who is actually going to be saved. So I don't think we can claim anything. We can pray for people, yeah. and we can beg God, and we can entreat Him. But we can't twist His arm in any way, shape, or form, okay?
That's, up, that's to the individual, between the individual and God. And that human divine interaction. Yes? If we were to, in prayer, ask the Lord to find a safe specific thing, is that telling God what to do in kind of an humble way, or is that not a right kind of thing to ask God? Well, I would not use that terminology. Yeah. Because that's a, this uh, that's an out of context terminology. Okay. You could ask somebody to uh, God to protect somebody, something like that. Right, but but this idea of binding, uh, we can't do. Again, Satan will be bound at the end of the tribulation by God's angel in the pit for the thousand-year messianic yeah. kingdom. But we don't have the power to do that. If we did, I'd do it. No, I know. <laughs> we don't want to ask God. I would, use the, I would use the term protect. Yeah. I would not be comfortable using this terminology. All right, let's finish up here on verse 20, the last verse of uh, section 118. And we'll bring our study to a close this evening. Verse 20. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Messiah. So even they, though they've got the lesson right, and they understand it uh, correctly... He continues his policy of privacy. Okay, he's not going to broadcast to the nation that uh, he is the Messiah anymore. So paragraph 118 illustrates their partial sight. They get it that he's still the Messiah, but next week when we get into section 119, we will see that they are still partially blind. So let's... Uh, Call it quits for tonight, and we'll pick it up next week with section 119. So let me go ahead and pray, and um, we'll uh, let you go. Father, again, we've seen Yeshua teaching and teaching and teaching, preparing the disciples for the ministry they will have when he leaves. And Lord, we know that you do the same in our lives. You teach us and teach us and teach us for the ministry that you want us to have right here. So help us, Lord, to learn the lessons so that you don't have to repeat them over and over again for us. Help us to pass the pop quizzes, the examinations, so that well, we, we can move on and gain and grow and mature and serve you in a more effective and efficient way day by day. And we ask this for your glory and the glory of Yeshua, our Messiah. And it's his name that we pray. Amen.